Jessica Keller, an oncology psychologist at Memorial Cancer Institute. I'm so excited to get invited back to present to you today about one of my favorite topics, especially in cancer care, of how to improve and maintain our relationships, no matter what our health status may be. As such social creatures, we humans are, relationships are absolutely essential to our well-being. So I'm going to share some information and some strategies aimed at promoting healthy interactions within our relationships. All right, so first and foremost, here's some things to remember as we get started. So remember that relationships, of course, are very tricky things, especially when they come under stress. So as unfortunately, as we see in the movies, we have this romantic idea that some incredible event might happen, like an oncology diagnosis that can fix other ailing areas of our life. However, we do see that relationships that tend to be strained before a cancer diagnosis will likely continue to be this way following it unless we intervene, and it is possible that they do end. But on the other hand, strong relationships tend to remain strong and may even strengthen throughout the experience. And hopefully some of those tips today will uh, we'll show you just how we can work on our relationships. It's also important to remember, especially when we're thinking about our partners within the relationship, how we manage as an individual, as a duo, a partnership, or as a group depends on our coping styles before the diagnosis itself. If you or the other person or people have always struggled with communication or found, found it challenging to deal with one's emotions or of others, we're unlikely to develop these emotional skills immediately, right? So just like riding a bike, they do take practice and we'll go over some ways to, to do that today. All right. Okay, it's working, excellent. So in this first section, we will concentrate on communicating just the simple facts, the facts of our diagnosis, maybe our treatment and the survivorship period to others. <laughs> Maybe. There we go. All right. So how do I talk about where I am at, right? Where, where are we at in our, our cancer experience? So one thing I always talk to people about, that there's no one right way that we prescribe, right? It has to do with our own personalities, our comfort level with communication, our own emotional state at the time. So a couple of thoughts that I put together that um, you know really help guide a lot of individuals that I work with is we want to just think, how open do I feel comfortable being with other people and talking about what's truly going on with me? We have those different levels of closeness within our relationships and how far do we want to go with others? How much do we trust that this will uh, be a conversation that is beneficial to everyone involved? What words do I want to use? You know, how do I talk about my diagnosis? Do I want to use the word cancer? Do I want to use the word tumor, illness, whatever it may be? You know, we want to actually script these conversations in ways that actually roll off the tongue. They make sense to us and our communication style. As we were talking about before, who do I trust? Who is privy and should be privy to the emotional details and these intimate details of my life? Who can handle it within my support system? We all know that we all have individuals that might be better attuned to helping us through particular situations and others maybe that because of their own emotional state aren't quite ready or able to accompany us. And then piggybacking off of that, who can truly respond to me in the way that I need? So, I often hear why, why should I talk about what's going on with me at all, especially from my most private people that I work with. So I, I think it really saves us a lot of trouble. You know, unfortunately we tell certain people and how lines get crossed, telephone gets played, like we all played in maybe in grad, uh, grade school. Um, others are kind of left to hear bits and pieces of information and sometimes the story gets twisted and with such a serious thing like an oncology diagnosis, 
how do people put their own projections onto it? So maybe they start to twist the story and think that things are worse maybe than they are. So we want to know that if people do have the true story of what's going on with us, then we can focus and they can focus their energies and efforts on what may be most constructive within the relationship itself, rather than worrying, oh, are they really talking about what's going on with them? But of course, and one that I'm most interested in, it, it helps open us up for the receipt of empathy and support, which of course is necessary when we are uh, navigating this diagnosis. All right, so in working with so many people throughout the years, I can certainly begin to appreciate the exhaustion that comes with managing a diagnosis. But we do see that it is often helpful to take the lead on particular types of communications and to be directive. I know it takes a lot of energy and, and effort sometimes to be this directive, but really we want to think that it saves us a lot of stress and energy in the long run. So we want to take the lead in these difficult conversations, especially if we can feel that people are tiptoeing around the issue or, or maybe not able to bring things up uh, themselves. So I always encourage people, I give you permission. I give you permission to ask me questions, to talk about my diagnosis, if that's applicable to, of course, the individual that I'm working with. It's great to give some reassurance, if this is truly what you're looking for, that you don't expect answers or, or solutions to these problems. You just want someone there to listen and, and try to understand your feelings. But two, it's perfectly okay if you need another set of eyes and ears on the situation um, and would like some help with advice or research, of course, it's also okay to, to indicate that. But also, it's okay if you don't want that sometimes uninvited advice that, that is often too freely given. It's okay to indicate that you're leaving all of this great research up to your medical team. And I want the individuals that I work with to give yourself permission to not have to talk about cancer if that's the last thing that you want to go over, especially when you've spent all day managing side effects or something like that. So if it's applicable to you, it's okay to ask to talk about anything but your diagnosis or what's going on. Saying something as simply as, and I've had people actually write this on note cards before, thanks for asking, doing fine, I'm just so sick about talking about this, tell me something fun, what's going on with you? You know, ways to diffuse the situation and thank them for their concern, but without having to go into too much detail that you're not comfortable giving. Um, so as we said, let the other person know if it's okay to ask you questions. It's okay for you to let others know um, when the, what they're doing it might be causing more stress than benefit within the relationship. And easier said than done, I can appreciate sometimes, but we want to be really specific. I know lots of people say, hey, anything you need, just let me know. It's okay to take them up on it, number one, but also be specific about what you're truly looking for within that relationship is well within our right and certainly encouraged. All right. So, however, in light of that aforementioned exhaustion that we were talking about, hey, maybe recruiting others to help you talk about these things. Uh, we see we do this a lot in the hospital, especially when people are navigating their diagnosis, putting one person in charge of giving medical and survivorship updates to those further outside the immediate circle can be a great way to keep those relationships alive without feeling that you're responsible for communicating within all of them. As we said, it can be tiring and time consuming to be able to or to have to ask the and answer the same questions over and over. You can ask a trusted family member, a friend to share medical information. They can make the phone calls, the emails, the texts, all of those good things if you're comfortable with that. And you can also assign specific tasks, as we were saying before, to other family members who offered to help meal trains, those sign-up sheets, one of the, some of those wonderful websites that are available out there to uh, receive assistance. Um, 
certainly fair game. And really what this does is it helps us to be freer to nurture other aspects of the relationship, those that we truly want to perpetuate forward to help us through this difficult time. All right, so now let's go over some concerns that many people often face within relationships after a cancer diagnosis itself. So unfortunately, and I hear this far too often, as most of you have probably found out all too well, relationships can be our life force, of course, but often can be a source of disappointment after a diagnosis. People aren't stepping up the way that maybe we expected them to in certain areas. So there are several reasons, not an excuse, but reasons that uh, when we take a look and try to diffuse some blame that we might have, oh, they just don't care, or they don't like me, maybe some other things that could be going on. You know, many people have little experience with life-threatening illnesses and it's too threatening to them. They might not know what to say. They may be afraid of calling at the wrong time, don't know how to act. Also don't want to burden somebody if they're having a good day of asking about how they're feeling. I've heard that one a lot when I work with caregivers. And of course they just might be scared, scared for you, scared for their you, their loved one, but really it brings up a lot of existential fears. It makes cancer a reality rather than something that happens to other people or that we see on TV. Of course, they might have lost someone to cancer and your diagnosis, no matter what it may be, might bring up painful memories. Um, but also they might just not be able to offer you. They might not be capable of offering you the support that, that you expect. And that might be a very, uh, something to do with their personality and way of coping. Uh, and I hear, unfortunately, a lot of people do conclude that, oh, they just don't care about me. Of course, not minimizing the pain that's involved in this, but try to remember that their reactions may reflect their past experiences, them themselves, their losses, and not their feelings for you. However, it's not uncommon for a breach to occur, a separation to occur in a family or for old friendships to end. And I work with people to navigate, okay, where is that line uh, and when do we approach it? Uh, with regard to keeping these relationships going if they're no longer serving us. So again, comes that aforementioned self-advocacy. I really like this example of assertive communication that I found in one of my old psycho-oncology textbooks. Hey, I haven't heard from you in a while, thought it might be because you don't know what to say or you thought that I might be resting. Well, you don't need to watch what you say now any more than you did before. I'm the same person in many ways. I'm getting good care. Sometimes it's hard, but I'm not too busy or too tired for you, especially my relatives. I hope you won't let this come between us. I thought that was really masterful and um, hopefully everybody took notes on that one. <laughs> I know that's a descriptive way of, of just kind of breaking the ice and saying, hey, how, holding people accountable. I haven't talked to you in a while. You might be thinking that uh, I'm not up to it, but I really am. So this is a good icebreaker. But two, hey, what happens when it's the opposite? A lot of people tell me, oh my goodness, I'm being babied. I feel like I'm being smothered by my, <laughs> my significant other, even with the best of intentions. You know, I, I think that this certainly deserves a lot of self-advocacy too. You know, again, validating and your appreciation for them trying to, to help you out so much. But really, you know, what I work so hard on with, with people is despite a diagnosis and walking through it, we're really working hard to keep that sense of self and that sense of independence. And really, without meaning to, that can be undermined by our loved ones. The other things I see all too far too often, especially with social media, is the sense of nosiness that a lot of people come to me with that, oh my gosh, I don't know if this person's really my friend. I haven't talked to them in a million years, but all of a sudden they're posting all over my Facebook page and I kind of question their motives. Um, one of my young patients um, gave me this term uh, not too long ago and I thought it was perfect. It's almost like this grief tourist, right? The 
person that kind of stops by and feels really good about helping somebody in need. And I think the recognition of that, of course, is painful, but also an example of maybe a relationship that, that we don't want to propagate. Anyway, so for better, for worse, we and our relationships often change without an oncology diagnosis. It's well within our right to negotiate our own terms within these relationships. So a lot of times, especially in the survivorship role, I'll feel, I'll have people kind of return to their friend groups and, and their experiences and feel like, hey, I, I've just missed out on something or I can't quite relate to people in the way that I used to because of what I've been through. Um, I hear a lot about this and, and not a, a stuck up type of way, but hey, you know, a lot of the things that these guys are worried about, I don't sweat the small stuff anymore. And I, that's kind of my new superpower that I never wanted, but you know, I'm, I'm just not able to connect on that level and have these conversations. Um, so you find that you're less interested in maybe hanging out or, or having these conversations. It might simply be that some of these friendships don't quite work anymore and, and that's okay. It happens as we said, cancer or no cancer. So, of course, you know, while I encourage, and we all have probably seen the research that social connections are so important, even in our very survival as a human race diagnosis or no diagnosis, we are empowered to choose how we wish to define what these relationships are. Are they close relationships, not close relationships? How do we describe them? Define our roles within them, the goals that we have for them. Uh, we want to nurture, of course, those that have nurtured you in the past, but certainly those that truly do fit your current state of being, your sense of self, and the person that you continue to become and have shaped by this incredible experience. So one of the biggest concerns I often work with in family units is the transition within different roles and responsibilities. So, you know, of course, as we go through these treatments, these surgeries that someone else has to fill in for us. And that can, of course, undermine our loss of sense of self or our sense of self, undermine our sense of self and lose that feeling of control that we have. It's often met with a lot of frustration as we're not able to maybe fill in as we uh, normally would. And for the person that's doing the filling, if, especially if they haven't done these things within the relationship, the partnership, the, uh, the friendship, family, can cause a deal of anxiety and stress as we adjust to um, these new roles and doing them correctly. So it's also possible that, hey, all too soon following treatment that your loved one that fills in for you might expect you to just automatically re-enter the roles that you have previously filled. It might cause tension if you're not quite ready to do so, which a lot of people aren't, especially, you know, we all know too well that just when treatment ends, it doesn't mean our concerns are over with or that we are well. Uh, but two, maybe we don't want to step into those particular roles that we used to, to play for whatever reason. So we talk about renegotiation. Re maybe that's something we want to do. We want to look at our partnerships and say, hey, this is working pretty well for us. Maybe let's keep the way th things the way that there are, or maybe let's continue to shift them. You know, trying to find these ways to fit every stage of, of our experience is really important. And then, of course, it's possible that others might really, really like the role that we have them play now and kind of block us for returning for their own reasons, but also because they're trying to protect us from that. So again, that goes in with undermining our sense of independence and return back to quote unquote normalcy. So uh, kind of this, the same thing, our roles within the, uh, the relationships change. The balance of power often shifts when we become not equal partners, but caregiver recipient. And our perceptions of each other do alter. 
So I, this is a number one topic I, I often talk about within this. I see those that have always been in control, fiercely independent, having to become now reliant on their partner. The partner might be ready for that, but accepting support for especially my caregivers out there can be just unimaginable uh, and they often start to disengage or pull away because of the difficulty they have um, within this partnership. So this is best highlighted, as we said, you know, by that caregiver patient role, uh, one of the most difficult relationship uh, stressors that there are. Uh, it can be, as we were kind of saying, it's, it's, it can be hard to reverse. It can be hard, you know, after that seismic shift that we experienced to give the all clear and say, okay, now maybe we can rebalance the, the power that our caregivers can give us more of that independence and reassurance, and they can be themselves reassured that, that we're doing okay. Or as we were saying before, it can be far too easy to reverse that. You know, when a lot of people do come to me in survivorship saying, hey, everybody expected me to snap back right to normal, but right back into what we were doing before. Um, so that's another thing that, that I often work with people through. So something really good to remember um, and kind of where we see that shift kind of coming back into balance um, around this month's post-treatment, um, we see that the distress of, okay, let's figure out what the heck just happened to us as not only individuals, but as a couple, as a family, as a, a friend group, um, it, it becomes most salient and emotional at six months after treatment is over and then begins to steadily decline as people get used to this, again, <laughs> this phrase is used far too often, but this new normal. All right, so the progression as we were talking about uh, out of that active treatment also brings along its unique challenges within relationship. Um, people that I work with often feel quite misunderstood at survivors. So again, we take that teaching role, managing others' expectations, but also our own expectations for ourselves as we step outside of treatment. Um, you know, a lot of times too frequently, and we'll talk about advocacy of how to do this, but naturally people assume that we're doing okay. So sometimes the that support that we came to uh, really rely on is, is taken away rather quickly. Um, so we have to learn how to manage our own distress and discomfort about this. Um, so again, you know, especially being the cancer warrior that just beat X, Y, or Z, uh, it can be really hard, especially for our families to see the strongest among us is still needing help, especially after we have gone through this diagnosis. So a lot of people say they feel kind of abandoned after treatment ends. Um, this expectation from others to just, hey, leave it in the past, it's over. Unfortunately, we know all too well, that's not always the case. We wish it were that easy. And those among us, especially the caregivers, appearing well on the outside, you know, and struggling with these invisible things within us. Um, so all topic and very important topics for conversation. Okay. So along that same vein, another very common occurrence I encounter is difficulty asking, accepting, and accepting care from other people within relationships. Um, it can be awkward, it can be difficult to articulate what we need, um, also time consuming about having to tell everybody what to what could really help us. Um, but one of the things, especially to the parents <laughs> out there, one of the things I often say, hey, as a caregiver, you spent your entire lives preparing others for the opportunity and the honor of giving someone like you that support. So sometimes that'll help shift the uh, willingness to accept. Um, support. Other people are just so eager. So we know that communicating regularly, openly, and honestly with friends, relatives, anyone in our support system can alleviate stress, sadness, and being feel, feeling like we're stretched too thin as we transition um, throughout the different state treatment. And of course, being very specific about our needs. <laughs> We've talked about this a lot already. Um, uh, from an emotional and practical standpoint. 
right. as we say, you know, when others just aren't stepping up the way that we expect them to, it tends to come from a place of fear and not that it's an excuse. Um, but um, yeah, we've all experienced, I've heard some really incredible things, but some may say the worst possible things or may want to talk to you about their own experiences with cancer. I know far too many people experience that. It's very much okay to shut those conversations down immediately. It's okay to ask for what you need as well as, as we said, state what you don't need during this time. Okay, so all of this, how do we do all this? So coming up next is a series of communication strategies backed by research within uh, the psycho-oncology field. So a very common pitfall in long-term relationships, cancer or no cancer, is our tendency to assume what our other person, our valued other person, is thinking and feeling, even how they will behave. Yes, history tends to <laughs> predict the future. But especially with regard to navigating these relationships and the changes, we don't want to assume that we know what the other person is thinking or feeling exactly, or that we know, or they should know, what they um, would we need from them, or even that we know what they need from us. Uh, for example, many may think that their partner is scared, but really they might be feeling guilty for some reason or, or sad. Um, and probably number one, we might think that uh, someone going through an oncology diagnosis wants only encouragement and hope, but most often you know, we want somebody to accompany us or listen. So, hey, what do we do? We ask. You know, we're not used to asking and communicating in this way, but it's very, very important. We see all the time that instead of remaining quiet and suffering because, hey, we're not getting our needs met, telling what is actually needed in direct terms is so very important. Um, and again, communicating about what is helpful or unhelpful. So one of the best, most important strategies that we have when communicating with others is becoming aware of particular tendencies within ourselves and within others. Uh, first and foremost, and we don't often really stop and think about this, but I really encourage people to do so. What do we need? What do we need both personality-wise? What do we need both in this stressful situation? How, what makes us tick and how can that person provide for us? Uh, we also want to accept responsibility, right? We're not always so innocent in some of these relationships and, and within these dynamics. So recognizing some pool that we have um, within the dynamic that is making things a little bit more difficult. It's important for each person to, to see that and to take responsibility and, and help to change it if we do want the relationship to thrive. So here, um, to build awareness, some um, questions I have people ask, you know, when, within a, this can be with a romantic partner, a friendship, within a friendship, family unit, what topics do we agree on? What do we frequently argue about? Should we avoid some of those? Uh, when we do disagree, how do we each respond? What, what is our typical response style to each other? And how does that sound to the other person? Are we able to be honest with one another? Can we calmly discuss things? Or is one of us always yelling to try to resolve the disagreement? Does it get, dis does it, this disagreement get resolved? Do we criticize? blame, yell, walk away, whoops, please give in within these relationships. Usually you'll see that there's a balance. I mean, <laughs> yin to the yang in a lot of relationships, opposites do attract. Um, so recognizing these tendencies within ourselves um, is very important. Uh, we always want to check in, hey, when we did something well, when we communicated well, what was the secret sauce? How did that work? Try to capture that and propagate it and um, apply it to different situations. And hey, can we truly trust one another? You know, I, I, I think that even within our closest relationships, trust, especially with something so sacred like our emotions or, you know, this very intimate 
period of our life, very of vulnerability, we have to feel as though we can trust the other person with what we are uh, discussing about. And hey, different types of relationships call for different levels of trust and different communications. And that's okay. So as we know very well, relationships are all about give and take, and we must hard, work hard to manage our own expectations here. Uh, we wanna always try to remember, even when we are the individual that's maybe going through the diagnosis that the other, the other person in the partnership is suffering in their own way too. Not comparing, not, <laughs> not competing, but um, it, it's, it's important to, uh, recognize that sense of empathy and to also disentangle ourselves from any guilt that we might feel. Um, we want to respect people's boundaries, but also, as we said earlier, their capabilities. Some people just aren't capable of giving us what we need, and we have to accept that or choose. Do we have to accept that within a particular relationship? Uh, number one, wish we could do this, but we all know that we can't control someone else. Uh, but what we do have control over is our own actions and responses. And it's our responsibility if we want to see change to shift ourselves. Uh, we often know, as we said before, that dyads often have different coping strategies uh, to deal with conflict. Um, if the other person doesn't seem as upset as we expect them to be, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're suffering any less, it's just different. Um, so recognizing uh, particular tendencies is, is a really great idea. Uh, we want to give people, the, uh, the other person, the freedom to work out their emotions in the way that's most suited to themselves within reason, without judging it. Um, and of course, talking about how uh, each of the, person, the people in the um, relationship deal best with stress. Um, and we have to work really hard Again, with our own reactivity, that adjusting perceptions that differences in coping are negative, right? It can be a good thing, as we said. It's all about balance. We just know we need to know how to work with them uh, to make it work for us. Now, these are very gross generalizations, but time and time again have been really helpful. Um, I find it helpful to share common ways that different genders are typically socialized um, within um, emotions and uh, how we communicate. So typically associated with a masculine role is the use of, hey, looking at things and then determining the emotions <laughs> after they occur. It tends to be more masculine. Um, women tend, or individuals identifying as feminine, um, reaching out in real time to discuss, problem solve, and process fears as they're occurring, right? So a disconnect can often happen there. It's usually after the fact with uh, more masculine individuals. Um, again, associated with a more masculine outlook, employing um, problem solving internally, right? Not maybe communicating with it because it comes so naturally to that uh, particular gender role. Uh, tending to focus more on a sense of control, maybe the practicalities of, of navigating a difficulty, especially a diagnosis. Um, we have to recognize that that is most um, likely how some, uh, someone identifying um, as masculine will react. Uh, we want to recognize that need um, tendency toward protectiveness um, of others and ourselves, right, of, of themselves, um, often leading to less open disclosure, um, attempts to minimize the impact of changes as, as a coping skill has been shown time and time again throughout the literature. This can often be interpreted as denial, but not necessarily so. They tend um, to have more avoidance coping behaviors overall. And also it's very helpful to, if the other individual within the relationship identifies with masculinity, um, recognizing that discussing problems that cannot be solved can be very, very frustrating um, in that regard. And on the flip side, more feminine ideals tend to have more of a priority on social support, 
um, tending to report greater stress, higher risk for emotional distress overall, um, tending to have a greater sense of responsibility um, and caring for others, as well as I think that is also important to recognize that simply sharing and discussing problems that cannot be solved, just, hey, we're not looking for solutions can be very helpful uh, to someone who identifies with the feminine role. So I know the whole Venus Mars <laughs> debate or, yeah, uh, is still ongoing, believe it or not but this has helped a lot of romantic relationships over the years in my practice. All right, so hey, a lot of information on these next couple of slides, but some general um, communication tips that, that we um, communicate. Find a time to talk, uh, to really just focus on each other. Uh, actually pencil it in, you know, it's a, especially in today's technological age, it's more likely to occur if it actually has a, a place on the schedule. Um, we also want to choose particular times to discuss our health if we can help it. I know that's not always the case, especially as we get those phone calls and, and health updates. But we want to really watch that this is contextualized and cancer just doesn't become uh, too pervasive in our everyday dealings, right? So, you know, as I often tell people, you are so much more than your diagnosis and we have to communicate as such as well. Um, you know, hey, a weekly catch up is often helpful for individuals that I've worked with. So maybe finding your uh, particular time period is, is a great idea. Or simply, hey, I got something on my mind. Is it okay if we talk about this? You know, for spur of the moment topics is a is a good way to lead into these discussions. Uh, you know, as we were saying, this is a new way of communicating for a lot of people. So one of the best interventions is to practice write down some bullet points of what you want to express and how you want to express it. Um, you know, especially, hey, a lot of people I know suffer from some chemo brain there, right? So uh, having these talking points is a great idea, but especially when emotions come into play and say, oh, should have said that in the moment, <laughs> tip of the tongue state. Uh, it can also help us prioritize and identify what's most important to us. Uh, we want to share how we can be supported, as we said, uh, talking honestly about our feelings, both positive and negative, is very important. So another hot topic. I first heard about this in graduate school with the very dramatic phrase, the tyranny of positive thinking, or now more toxic positivity. Of course, the caveat is, you know, we don't want people dwelling in the negative, but we also know that focusing exclusively on the positive, especially when it's seemingly far out of our reach in the moment when we're going through these distressing things cannot be helpful. Um, so we want to try overall, and I'm speeding up because I talk a lot. <laughs> we want to try to support and validate both poles of emotions, especially um, when we're talking to an individual with a diagnosis but also vice versa when we're communicating with our caregivers. And it's okay to call people out saying, you know, guys, I'd love to see the world the way that you do right now, but I can't access it. And that's okay. You know, asking for people just to slow down with you for a while, that's what it's all about. All right, so. We have to recognize our nonverbals too. We say a lot with our eyes, our hands. I know I have a lot of nonverbals going on here. So I see myself in the uh, window there. Uh, but we have to remember that our facial expressions, our body language, our gestures, our tone all contribute to the message and often can detract from our message if it doesn't match up. So just one of the things that we wanna be cognizant about within our relationships, especially when we're expressing our needs. Um, practice active listening. This is an age old psychology technique. Uh, really being in the moment with somebody instead of automatically thinking how we're going to respond or um, what we're going to say next. Great technique to just restate what somebody is telling you in your own words and then checking with them to make sure that you're getting it. 
Um, using I statements is always very important, avoiding any sort of blame. Um, this helps to reduce a sense of defensiveness and to enhance a sense of connectedness. We want to try to use um, plural <laughs> pronouns like we, us, and our. Um, showing that we are a united front when we're talking about um, particular difficulties or our needs. So other communication skills, as we're saying, be specific and clear. For example, hurt could mean, hey, we're sad about something, we're disappointed by something, or we're physically hurt, just as an example. Um, making requests rather than blaming or shaming, especially <laughs> with kiddos. This is an important technique. Um, and all too far, especially when we're, we're frustrated, easy to, um, to make broad statements like you never or you always do this. Um, trying to avoid this whenever possible is important in these um, developing relationships. Um, trying to remain calm. As we know, new frontiers in our lives, in our relationships, we're dealing with some pretty heavy things. So finding a way to calm ourselves down in the moment can be very, very helpful. All right, so here I'm actually going to kind of skip over this, not rushing the conversation, taking turns, making sure we don't over uh, dominate the conversation and ask for feedback is very important in a reciprocal relationship. So um, building and rebuilding relationships is our last section here. Um, we want to talk about different strategies within romantic relationships, family relationships, and even in our friendships too. They're all applicable. So uh, general tips for connection. As we said, hey, it's not all about the cancer. Please have those conversations talking about anything but. Don't be afraid to use humor to cope. I know not everybody will get it, but believe me, it's a great way to diffuse tension. Um, also to be just release some tension within relationships just in general, not necessarily about the stressful situation that we're undergoing. Um, Hey, I would love to have people recognize what skills do you already possess, especially within the relationship? What can we use to make communication even better? What have we been doing in this situation that we can apply to a new situation? Uh, you guys know a lot more than you think you do. Uh, we want to take time for play, even when we're dealing with the seriousness of, of what's going on in our lives. And two, even at platonically, we can recognize, I know this is a, a buzz phrase within psychology, our love language. Um, how do people like to show, uh, like for us to show you, show them that we're engaged with them, that we love them. A lot of people like verbal expressions, being reassured, being touched, small acts of service, maybe even gift giving. <laughs> And of course, even though this diagnosis, of course, can stop us in our tracks and we don't know exactly what the future holds, it's important to plan. It's important to plan not only for ourselves, but our families and the relationships are within themselves. Okay, so we want to try to stay involved in those social activities, even though, unfortunately, we might be under constraints uh, within our physical status. But even if we're not able to, to go for a while to hang out with our friends, hey, letting them know, keep inviting me. Hopefully, one of these days we'll hit on it and I'll feel able to go. It's important to feel as though we, we continue to play a role um, within the, the dealings of our social groups. And of course, RSVPing with a disclaimer saying, hey, hope to make it, don't count on me, but you know, put me as a maybe <laughs> for these events is, is great. Uh, and of course, communicating openly about what we might need. Um, I think another great tip is to really um, treat relationships with what we call in mindfulness uh, as a beginner's mind. Like when we were first getting to know somebody, whether romantically, whether, hey, our, 
our child, whether it is our, our best friend, be curious about our loved one, get to know them. I mean, hey, these incredible events change us all and trying to come to terms with who we are in this moment is important, but also very important to recognize how maybe the other person has changed. That can only help us out with being curious and engaged and making things fresh again, especially when we feel like we have just been through a war zone. All right, so here are some tips on just how to maybe get at that within our relationships. How has it changed? What do we need to change? How can we personally be a better person, a partner for somebody else? what's working and what just doesn't work anymore. That often changes. So as we were saying, we are so much more than cancer. So a lot of times, especially in today's day and age, a lot of people ask, how can I get out there? How can I meet new people? Oh gosh, how can I date if I <laughs> would like to do that? Um, and a lot of people wonder, when is the best time to disclose? Hey, I, I'm a survivor. Uh, here's what I'm going through, or here's what I have gone through. Again, wishy-washy answer, everybody's different, but we tend to see as a group that earlier on in the relationship is actually most helpful. Um, but of course, once we have enough information knowing that um, you know, the relationship is going somewhere um, and that you can trust uh, the other individual, uh, oftentimes brings us closer together. Hey, if a friend or a potential romantic partner decides that they're not interested, not minimizing the pain that can come with this, but better to know in the beginning and then find it out later um, because it has to do, as we said earlier, a lot with who they are as an individual and maybe what they've been through. Um, and as we were saying, you know, when it comes to dates or you know, going out with new friends, it's okay to disclose what you might need uh, based on your physical status. Great to push yourself ever so slightly. It's a push to even engage in these relationships, uh, but at the same time, we want to take our time. And you don't have to make a big deal about it either. Okay.